Good morning and welcome to 2022. It's great to have everyone with us this morning. Hopefully you had a really nice Christmas and it's been a, a great new year. Uh, this morning we are going to use a video by Canadian Baptist Ministries. They send it to us uh, each year and uh, just to uh, encourage that ministry and also to uh, give pastors and churches uh, a slight break. So anyway, uh, I will be uh, using that this morning, or we will be using that. Uh, next week, we will be coming to you on the 9th, and uh, it will be Communion Sunday, and I will have a special message aimed at the incoming new year. So anyway, God bless you. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, they've done an excellent job. They've got great resources there and, uh, they've done an excellent job with this video. So enjoy, be encouraged, and we'll see you, uh, next week. God bless and take care. Hi, my name is Jennifer Lau, Executive Director of CBM. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for a thrill of hope, a very special global worship service. Over these next few minutes, we will rejoice together that despite the challenges of our world in this time, our God has not left us. Indeed, He never leaves us. His presence and His promises are our ultimate hope, even in the midst of crisis and despair. As God's mission people, we are thankful to be called to serve Him together in a time such as this. And even as we see suffering all around us, we give thanks that He calls each of us to be part of His work of redemption amidst brokenness. Thank you for walking in solidarity with the marginalized and vulnerable in our world. And now let's join the worship team from Louisville Baptist Church as we celebrate that our Lord has come and that He is alive and at work in our world. Yes. Yeah. 
My name is Callie Hutton. Let me tell you a story of hope from Bolivia. Estella lives with her two young daughters in the middle of the Cancha, a large and crowded outdoor market in the heart of Cochabamba. Her apartment is a single room with no windows. Outside, she shares a bathroom with others who live in the building. Estella struggles to support her family in the best of times. However, recently, her husband, who is in prison, told her he had another family and would be cutting off her support. While Estella works selling food, COVID has turned the once bustling market into quiet streets, keeping her sales quite low. To make matters worse, she discovered she has a growing tumor that needs treatment, but is unable to pull together the money for the necessary medical care. Unable to make an income under the lockdown measures and having already reduced their meals to once a day, Estella eventually ran out of food in complete desperation, she shared how she cried out to God, asking for his protection. That's when she got a call inviting her to come to the local church down the street. With funding from CBM, the congregation had prepared a care package with two weeks worth of food and supplies. While food relief isn't a long-term solution, during an emergency, it can be critical in keeping families from starvation. The church's care package allowed Estella's family to get through their worst season, providing them the support to keep going and bearing witness to the compassionate character of God expressed through his people. Thank you for Bolivia, God. Keep the family safe and give them hope in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hello, my name is Suraj Kamarawali. Let me tell you a story of hope from India. Swami Mandapalli is a seven-year-old boy studying class three in a public school in his village, Kurada, India. He lives with his five-member family in a small, single room thatched hut. His father drives an auto rickshaw and earns around $110 per month the only source of income. While about $30 goes towards his grandmother's medicine, it indeed is a struggle to see food on their plates. Often, Swami sleeps on an empty stomach. Swami was also developing disinterest in studies as he could not meet the standards of the school. As his parents being illiterate and poor could not encourage and provide study material. It was then a local Baptist church through CBM conducted an awareness camp on free tutoring classes and its benefits. He says, I am delighted with the personal quality teaching attention and free study material. I want to be a doctor and serve the poor in my village. 
Lord, thank you for the work of your church in India. We pray that more children will be able to attend school programs and build a brighter future. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, my name is Joe Bredi, and I would like to share with you a story of hope from Lebanon. The Rami family lives in Beirut. They have two daughters, a 12-year-old and an 18-year-old who suffers from diabetes and needs to take insulin. The husband and the wife both lost their jobs because of the port blast and the economic situation. They have been surviving on as little as $25 a month. When members of a local Baptist church visited them, they shared that their home had been heavily damaged in the blast and that an NGO had helped them fix their glass and aluminum fixtures, but they still needed to have their broken fridge replaced. When he saw the fridge, the father said, we have been approached by many people and all they've done is take pictures of us and our house and never deliver on their promises. I had gotten to a point where I had stopped answering my phone because I expected people to lie to me, but you, you are different. During one of their visits, they shared the gospel with them. They were very interested to know more about the biblical narrative and how it tied into the idea of salvation. Since then, the family had been faithfully attending a weekly Bible study with the church. Their lives have drastically changed as they are experiencing the love and care of God. The couple had many problems due to their financial situation. But since they have been faithfully praying and studying God's word, their relationship has positively improved. Dear God, today we pray for our friend in Lebanon. Thank you for the people in the church that have helped fix their homes and share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. We ask that their lives continue to improve and that you keep them safe. Amen. It's amazing to hear how God is at work in Lebanon. And we're privileged today to be joined by Eli Haddad, who will be sharing with us from God's Word. Eli and his wife Marae live in Beirut, Lebanon, and they serve with CBM as team leaders for the Middle East and North Africa. Eli also serves as president of the Arab Baptist Theological Seminary. We're so grateful, Eli, that you're going to share with us and looking forward to hear what God has laid on your heart. And just as Eli comes, we're going to hear the scripture read by children of CBM staff. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And rolling it, he found the place where it is written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The last two years have been different from anything that we have experienced before. The entire world has encountered major disruption and disorientation due to the pandemic. This has led to major hardships globally. This is in addition to the various regional and local calamities numerous communities face around the world. Many people and communities are reaching exceptional levels of hopelessness. As we celebrate Christmas this season, what is it that we hope for? And what hope can we present to others around us? What hope can we promise a suffering world at Christmas? A good starting point at Christmas time is to reflect on why Jesus came into this world. There are many passages in scripture that help us answer this question. To gain a good perspective, let us turn to our text in Luke 4. At the beginning of the ministry of Jesus, he enters the synagogue in Nazareth 
and reads the passage from Isaiah 61, a passage that promises the coming of God's salvation. Then he starts preaching from the text. Jesus summarizes the main content of his sermon as, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The today of salvation is inaugurated in the ministry of Jesus. In this summary, Jesus presents us with the hope that we are looking for, the hope of Christmas that we need to be reminded of today. First, we find the hope of Christmas in the knowledge that God fulfilled his promise. With Jesus, the time of fulfillment had come. Have you ever waited for a long time for something? Do you remember the joy experienced and the fulfillment and realization of what has been anticipated? Jesus' sermon was, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The fact that the promises are fulfilled brings much joy and hope. But the joy and hope that we have are not only because a promise was fulfilled. The very content of the promise brings great hope. In this passage, Jesus gives us a snapshot of his ministry, the mission that he came to this earth to fulfill. The religious leaders of Jesus' day were awaiting the Messiah who will deliver them from the, their political foes. But that was not God's plan. That was not why Jesus was sent. However, for those looking to God for genuine hope, for those in need of God, Jesus was the answer. Jesus had the message of good news. He expressed his social concern using the words of Isaiah. And this social concern relates to spiritual realities, not to political ideologies. Luke does not present Jesus as a social reformer, nor as addressing the political structure of his day. Jesus, however, is deeply concerned with the literal, physical needs of people as he is with their spiritual needs. The words of Jesus work at both levels. He heals the blind, but he also brings light to those in darkness. We detect a similar portrayal of the ministry of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. In chapter 4, Jesus begins to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He then unpacks the content of this kingdom. He demonstrates it by healing the sick. Then he teaches it in the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon starts with what we call the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted, and so on. Glenn Stassen argues that we frequently miss the point Jesus was making because we interpret these Beatitudes as wisdom teaching rather than prophetic teaching. Interpreting the passage as wisdom teaching means that if we mourn, are pure in heart, and are peacemakers, if we are virtuous, then we can enter the kingdom of heaven. But if we think that we can live up to those ideals, then we fall into self-righteousness. This becomes a gospel of works righteousness. Wisdom teaching emphasizes human action. If we act in a way that fits how God has ordered the world, then this gets us good results. A grace-based prophetic interpretation, on the other hand, emphasizes God's actions. Blessed are those who mourn, not because mourning is a virtue, but because God is gracious and Jesus came to deliver us from our sorrows so that we no longer mourn. The Beatitudes passage is not about high ideals, urging us to become poor, prisoners, blind, and victims so that God will reward us. It is a passage celebrating God acting graciously to deliver us from our poverty and captivity into God's reign of justice and joy. The mission of Jesus is to inaugurate the kingdom of heaven that brings good news to the poor, the oppressed, the blind, and those who are mourning. Then Jesus moves on in his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount to include us in his mission by giving us the role of being salt, light, and the city on a hill. Then he gives us a set of transformative initiatives that we can make in response to life's challenges. This is what Stassen calls participative grace. The kingdom of God is not about what God does while we passively watch, 
nor is it about our effort while God passively watches. The kingdom of God is performative. It is God's performance in which we actively participate. We become conduits of God's grace. This means that we are blessed because there was a time we were mourning and Jesus came to comfort us. And as we experience God's grace working in our lives, it overflows so that those who are mourning, whom we encounter every day, are blessed because God's grace working through us will comfort them. This is the way the kingdom breaks into the world. This is the content of the good news. The poor and the oppressed, the blind and the captive, can experience the deliverance of God through an encounter with Jesus and with the followers of Jesus. This is the hope of Christmas, that God broke into our world to redeem it, to restore it, to release it, and to deliver it. This is why we celebrate Christmas. Because of the birth of Jesus, because of the incarnation of the Son of God, in Him we can be restored to God. So we have this strong message of hope at Christmas while the world around us is still suffering. One crisis after another, one calamity after another, one hardship after another. How do we offer this message of hope to a hungry person who has given up on the world and has fallen into total despair? How can our churches become communities of hope that can bring kingdom healing to the hurt and comfort to the suffering? I would like to suggest a few ideas of what such a community of hope can look like. First, as a starting point, at the root of a community of hope is a repentant community that purifies itself by identifying the sins of the world that have crept into our church communities and repent from them. We purify ourselves not by disengaging from the world and become isolated from it, but to remain in the world to engage it with the kingdom agenda. A repentant community frees itself from the entanglements of the world so that it can become a moral compass for the world. A repentant community takes responsibility for its actions, or lack thereof, and for the way it has impacted the world. Second, a community of hope leads differently in times of political crisis, economic crisis, or a viral pan pandemic. A community of hope does not respond through fear, panic, or self-preservation. Rather, it responds by acknowledging God's sovereignty and by putting its full trust in God. And it leads by having a vision for God's ways and by caring for others. Third, a community of hope shepherds its society, church as pastor, not out of a position of authority, but out of a position of service and care for the society, out of love for the sinners and the broken. A community of hope is a self-giving community. Fourth, a community of hope is concerned with the public affairs of its society. It does not align itself with a political party or a political system. Rather, it aligns itself with the kingdom of heaven. And finally, a community of hope is an embracing community. It does not tolerate any kind of racism or prejudice. A divided and segregated community has nothing to teach the world about unity and integration or about love and acceptance. We live in a fallen and sinful world. It is not a surprise that we experience one crisis after another. It's not a surprise that many are poor, and marginalized, and in despair. This is the world that we live in. However, this Christmas, we have the opportunity to remember why Jesus came into the world. He inaugurated a kingdom that brings deliverance and hope to this aching world. We also have the opportunity to become communities of hope, whom God can use to change our societies. It is at the center of God's design that he sends his church into the world to, to participate in his mission of redeeming all things. As we celebrate Christmas this year, I pray that our churches become these missional communities of hope that God can use to bring hope to the world. Merry Christmas.
Hello, my name is Daryl Buston. My wife, Laura Lee, and I have been serving in Rwanda since 2012. We've discovered that families in Rwanda are really struggling. Let me tell you a story of hope. This is Theonest. He is a deacon in his church, and he used to be quite proud of the job that he did as a husband. After all, he only had one wife, he never hit her, and he tried his best to feed his family. But after participating in one of the family ministry seminars offered by CBM's Baptist partner here in Rwanda, AEBR, Theonest realized that he actually had some very damaging habits that were hurting his family. He communicated very little with his wife and he resented it whenever she commented on it. He left all of the care and discipline of the children up to her, doing next to nothing to help and encourage them. An honest evaluation forced Theonest to recognize that he was actually the cause of most of the stress and fighting in his family. As a result of the family training, Theonest apologized to his wife and children and they have begun to make significant changes in what happens in their household. He and his wife are not only excited to pass on what they know to others in their own church, they also hope to see all the families in their community become places where people truly flourish. Through the Women's Literacy and Family Ministry Project, CBM is committed to helping restore broken families. After the training, Theonest said, I'm grateful to CBM for their support to help build healthy families which give God glory. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for all the families in Rwanda that they may feel your presence with them. We pray for them to have hope for a future where they can flourish. Amen. Hello, my name is Michael Waddell. Let me tell you a story of hope. This is R.B. John. He and his wife are small-scale farmers living in a remote community in Capiz province of the Philippines. Rather than moving to the city, he decided to stay in his rural community and continue working on his family's farm. R.B. was experienced in farming in the traditional Filipino way, which depends on synthetic farm inputs and chemicals that rob the soils of their God-given nutrients. Small-scale farmers in the Philippines are among the poorest of the poor and often struggle to provide food for their own family. RB was invited to join Food for Life, CBM's Faith Plus Work initiative with our partner, Kabugana'an Philippine Ministries. As a member of Food for Life, RB was introduced to new ways of farming. He received training on chemical-free farming, how to produce his own organic compost, and the SRI system for rice farming that produces greater yields and higher quality crops. This has given Arby great excitement as he implemented these new farming practices in his own field. His farm has become a model for other farmers in his community. He is already experiencing a big difference in the growth and the development of his rice, which means increased income and healthier food for his family as well as his community. R.B. says, I am so glad for this kind of initiative. In my way of farming now, the natural way, with SRI technology, I feel gladness and joy in my heart. I feel closer to God, the Creator, as a disciple of Christ, and begin to appreciate more the environment with God's free gifts of soil, water, air, and the living organisms in it. I have a strong faith that God will bless the works of my hands and prosper my endeavors so much so that I desire to produce safe, healthy, and nutritious food for my family and community. As I observe the rice grow healthy, the joy in my heart is more than enough for me. Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity you provided to J.B. John through CBM to fulfill his dream and to provide for his family. I pray that you provide more resources and opportunities for many other families in the Philippines to fulfill their dreams. In Jesus' name we pray. Let's continue in prayer. God, our Father, we thank you that hope has come in Emmanuel. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us. Lord, your light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Lord, in this time, we pray for your church. We pray for local expressions of your body around the world, 
who are called to love you and love others. This day, Lord, I pray that you would empower your church to be a community of hope, that you would empower your church to shine light in the darkness. Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the hope that is found in him. May we be beacons of that hope, offering it to all who need it. In Jesus' name. Amen. And now uh, I'm excited to share with you this video from our partners in Myanmar. Merry Christmas! Thank you for being part of our service today. My prayer is that we will continue to collectively work at being communities of hope that help to usher in the shalom of God's kingdom within this aching world. God longs to redeem and restore all things to himself, and he invites us all to play a part in that work. What a privilege. So church, let's go and continue to boldly be the church, the center of God's mission. We are thankful that we get to do this in partnership and fellowship with you and your congregation. Together, let's embrace our broken world through word and deed. Ama namin sumasa langit ka. Yan di surga. Katong nong swa sanctifie. Sea tu nombre. Yutong hang joy tin sang. Utu peleo chakula che tu chakila siku. ก็ให้เป็นไปอย่างนั้นในแผ่นดินโลกวิมเฮมะโซอัฟแอนจันโอดุยอภิมยากุลดอมวะอาร์เจสเซฮัมเนปรุงก็ตุกกันยิราบก็ตัวเกลีรันไนยาอัลมุลคาวันกูวะตาเพราะว่าประเทศรงยาวทั้งปิงนี่วิ่งอยู่เนี่ยอามีนอามีนอามุนอามีนอามีนอามีน Amen. Amen. Reveriaho. Amen. 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 Amen.
Yeah.